built an incubator, invested in seven startups, moved to Cape Town, did the same thing again. Small town does fuck up consistently is, is, is hiring the right people and going to market. Money was gone, everything had gone, and I'm back at my mum's. A massive punch in the face. And asked me to help him build a learning center um, for an airline. So I'm like, sure, okay, I can do that. I didn't know how to do that, but sure, I can do that. Best performing people in any arena in the world have support networks. From Simon saying, you're in the band. I went, uh, what band? Simon Cowell's first boy band. And, if, and Europe has a massive efficiency and productivity problem. Don't get productivity up. We don't have any of the nice things in society. We have Today, we're joined by Dan Bound, the co-founder of Superseed, one of the UK's largest seed funds, focused on AI and industrial automation. Deploying 50 million pounds, Let's get stuck in. But just before we do, let me introduce this week's sponsor of the Open VC podcast, Intercom.com. Intercom help founders by making your customer service 24 7. Through their use of innovative AI, you can answer 50% of your customer needs instantly. Intercom is offering one year free if you use the code OPENVC, all in caps at the checkout using the link in the description below. And let's get back to the episode. Dan, welcome to the Open VC podcast, season one. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on today. I'd like to explore your career before you became this powerhouse in the venture capital scene here in London, um, because it's really colorful. I think the first job you ever had was modeling, yeah. which is straight after school. You happen to get yourself quite a famous agent. Yes. And what seems like, <laughs> I've done my research. <laughs> Would you mind telling us who it was and the kind of things that you got up to? At school, and um, I was dating a girl whose sister was a photographer. I got a phone call from Models One saying, would you come up and see us? Like, I don't want to do that. That's not, that's not me. That's not... And then I remember going home and seeing my mum that night and saying, look, I had this phone call and she just said, just go for it, Dan. What's the worst that can happen? Just go for it. Just for them. And Davina McCall was my, was my agent, and we just had a blast for a couple of years. So I was still at school, I was 16, I was still at school. It, an absolute blast. I got to travel the world, I got to meet super cool, famous people. I was in the, to her house, she lived just up off the King's Road, and, and so I hung on part-time, and all my friends that had left school and worked full-time, and, and it was just lots of beautiful people. Cheese, <laughs> <laughs> we won't go into those. It was just lots of fun. It was just crazy times. I imagine it made it quite difficult to stay motivated at school if you're able to tap into that you're high social like career. I had motivation in the first place, and I love you for that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't panic at all. I did the bare minimum to, to scrape through and to not get thrown out of school. I had no interest at school. I was always interested in travel and experience and do. And I've always been good at fixing things. So my mum's friends would bring over their broken TVs or stereos or hoovers, and I was always good at fixing electronic things. I had this natural, natural ability to fix things and build things. So I was building bikes, motorbikes, cars. I've always been able to build and fix. So that was my, that was my thing. And but academic, I was, I was absolutely useless. Yeah, uh, not everyone's wired the same way for that. And you're clearly hyper intelligent in other ways because. After your modelling career, you were then scouted to join a boy band? Yeah. One of well, Simon Cowell's first boy bands? It was an audition for a pop video. So I went for an audition as part as modelling. And when you get a request audition, you go. Because if somebody asks for you to go to something, there's a high chance of you getting a job. So like X Factor is today, you've got this kind of panel of judges sat behind a desk in a dance studio. So you imagine a room, and Cowell was one of the judges, so it obviously... <laughs> Thing, but I can't sing or dance. I've, I've gone with an ask to go, and I go there, and I'm useless. And there's these backflips and amazing singers. I'm like, geez, this is this is really audition I've ever been to, right? As in for a video. And I said to the guy, I said, look, I, I'm useless. Thank you so much for seeing me. It was a real pleasure. And then I bumped into walking down Oxford Street, tying my shoe. I bent down to tie my shoelaces, stood up, and I physically bumped into this guy. I said, I'm so sorry. And it turned out to be this guy Gary, who was the other guy. Who was the and I went, yeah. Uh, I really liked you. Why didn't you come for another audition? I said, audition for what? He said, well, we're putting a pop band together. And this was in the days when X Factor was behind the scenes. All the manufactured boy bands and pop bands were built behind the scenes. Um, this move of Simon Cowell, just push it all into the public eye and then people won't hate it because the public's choosing it. So it was such a genius yeah. move on his account because everyone started hating manufactured bands. 
Um, and I said, sure, okay. So I went back to the dance studio the next week and then I got a phone call that night from Simon saying, you're in the band. I went, uh, what band? Uh, what are we called? What do we sing? Who are the other guys? Um, so it was a prop first boy band and it was a proper manufactured cheese ball 90s awful thing. But it was another opportunity and I'm 18 years old and what are you, what are you gonna do? It's like, sure, let's do it. So I did that for four years. Yeah, what a wonderful experience. So you've traveled the world as a model and you've traveled the world now as a musician. I think as a model, you, you kind of get paid by the job though. So it's quite clear cut yeah. about your uh, remuneration and it's quite quick to come through. Whereas when you're in a band, you have to deal with things like record labels and quite complex contracts. Yes. And perhaps they played into a bit of your naivety when you signed up to the band. Because when you try to leave, there's quite an interesting story behind how they weren't particularly nice to you. Well, I mean, if you're not writing the music, as a performer, you get whatever, 1% of the, of the income. You get nothing as the performer. You get lots if you're the writer of the, of the music. And I'm sure it's still the same. Obviously, things would have changed. You know, the shop, you get virtually nothing. If you write the music, it's shifted a bit, but they were the, they were the lion's share of the income. And when you sign up, yeah, I, I, they gave me a 10 grand signing fee just for signing a document. I remember, never forget, it was, a, it was in Barclay Square. The, the, the lawyer was called Alexis Grower, his name was. What am I signing? He said, look, Dan, you either sign this or you get out of my office, don't waste my time because I need to sign this behind you. And okay, sure. So I signed it. They gave me a check for 10,000 pounds. I met the guys at the time, it was about 200 quid a week, just per diems, just fine. Um, and I did it, I did one album. So we did one album, we released four singles. There was like a number of top 40 singles. It did, it was okay. I think it was a top 10 album, it did okay. But I, I didn't like it. I didn't like the music. I'm not a natural performer. I did, didn't like anything about it. And I realized, and I was dating a, a girl who was also in a band and she was struggling and I stopped. We would talk about this stuff all years in now. Yeah, about two years in, myself in the mirror. I'm just such a fraud. I'm such a fake, I've got to leave. And we're starting to make money. We're starting to break Europe. We're starting to break the Far East. The money's starting to be platinum handcuffed. If I don't jump ship now, I'm going to be platinum handcuffed to this forever. And I kind of manage it and I, I got rinsed. I mean, I had to give everything back, close down the bank accounts. I, I, I literally didn't have enough money to get a bus home, to get, to get, a, to get a cab from, it was, it was, it was brutal, but I, it was to, I, I could, and then I broke up with my girlfriend at the time. So she got the house, the car and everything. I didn't have an absolute penny. And I moved back to my mum's house with two suitcases just full of clothes and a portable television. I had to start again and that was it. It was uh, one minute you're flying first class around the world and the next minute you, you can't get a bus in Croydon. Wow, that's a hell of a roller coaster for someone that's only 21, yeah. but also I think perhaps your life experience, having had a career with modeling already, gave you a wise head such that you were in a place where you could see the future in, in some respects and know that it wasn't for you. And actually, even though it was scary to step away, you had enough confidence to know that that was the right move for you at the time. Yeah. Whereas a lot of 21 year olds would, would probably feel feelings, quite trapped and powerless. We all have these gut feelings. I think everybody, you, anybody, listening, everyone in the world has this kind of, they know the truth. We know our truth in our, in our hearts, in our guts. You might, you might process in your head and go, well, I, you know, the money or the, the prestige or the whatever, but you know, you, we know truth. You know your truth. I've differently gone back as in, I would have probably maybe stayed for a few more singles or made a, a, a bit more of a sideways exit or been a bit more measured about it. But sometimes you just gotta, you gotta just go for it. And yeah, I think it's it's really important to trust that, trust the you, and, and just trust yourself. So you, yeah, you have to do things because the truth will always come back and bite you on the ass. It's very true. Not being one to shy away from taking quite major risks, you end up getting your Windows and Apple engineering certificates yeah. as a coder. Yeah, I mean, how did that come about? How does someone who's been a musician, been a model, been in the creative space, end up getting? interested in tech. Well, there's a bunch you of mentioned you're a bit of an engineer. I because they're a bit dull. But basically, when I first left, I was, I, I was working minimum wage in a restaurant. I had nothing. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know which way was up. And also, these things that I kind of taken for granted were just ripped away. The relationship was dead. The, the career was gone. The money was gone. 
everything had gone and I'm back at my mum's. I left home about 17, I'm back at my mum's. I, oh, it was a massive punch in the face. And it was, a, it was, a, it was looking back, it was very healthy and, and a real learning, a massive learning experience because we only learn through hard times. You don't learn through good times. But it does, it, it you have to reset. So for about six months to a year, I'm like, I don't even know who I am. I don't know what I stand for. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm just lost in the wilderness. And it was a really, really hard time. I'm working minimum wage jobs just to help my mum with the mortgage, just so that there's some money coming in. And then a friend asked me to help him build. He knew that I was good with my hands and techie, a bit of a geek. A learning center. Um, I thought, sure, okay, I can do that. I didn't know how to do that, but I'm sure I can do that. And it was in that process of, of building networks and understanding computing. And this is like mid nineties. So it was just early, early days of the internet. Although no one had an email address, no one was browsing the web or doing anything. And I thought I quite like this. And it was at that point friend and help, helped him do the same, helped him effectively build the technology in his business. He had a 20, 30 strong internal comms business. And was like, oh, this is freaking awesome. This technology thing is a thing. This is gonna be a thing. Then there was later days, there was, you know, the dot-com boom and bust and then software becomes a thing and then more people going online and obviously the mid-2000s social media. And it, so I was kind of at the very early stages and I, I started installing networks and installing equipment because in those days it was the laptop or the desktop or the network or the server or the internet connection that was the important bit. Now you get these things for free, right? They give these things almost away. And it's the things that you use that are important, the software that you use. But back then it was the thing, it was the tin, it was the network. So that was my first ever business. So it kind of went, oh, technology is a thing, kind of went qualified as an engineer and understood how this technology thing worked. And then I moved on to the software side. So that, that was that transition piece, but it was all by fluke. It was all somebody saying, come and do a thing. I'm like, sure, I'll come and do a thing. Wow. So yeah, seizing the opportunity and then also having the adaptability to learn on the go and yeah, actually just go for every opportunity get the, the knowledge go. what's the worst you know the worst case is that it doesn't work out and then you get on the next road it doesn't work out you get on the next road you just gotta you know learn try look see and just go for it did you become an angel yes whilst well, you're doing I, the no, it I contract it. Then. so then i then i set up a business that was doing what i was doing which was installing networks and building computers and then teaching mainly mid-tier companies in London. That was our main client base. We had, a, I think, about 600 customers by the time I left. It was about how to install and manage and apply these new technologies. So that was my first business. Then I set up, I set up another business, which was in the kind of the, the, the war room social media world and then a video interviewing platform. So I did, I'm very good at nothing to something stuff. I'm not very good at functional okay. businesses. I like operational business, I lose interest. I, I really love that, a very early stage. And then built an incubator, invested in seven startups, moved to Cape Town, did the same thing again, started angel investing, very small tickets, but it was about helping other founders and entrepreneurs because founders wasn't a word then. We were all entrepreneurs and it wasn't that, all that sexy. And now then it, I don't know when it changed from entrepreneur to founder, but now we're all founders or they're all founders and and that's quite a cool and sexy thing. But back then you were, you were obviously unemployable. Um, building and selling a couple of businesses and then angel investing and then, and then becoming a VC. When you were making these early angel investments, do any stick out as complete utter disasters All that you would them. never have ever touched? All of them. Wow. All of them are nice winners. All, listen, I think the, my key learning from early, 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 so we're talking now, hmm, but, in 2000s, doing 20, 50k checks, is it's just a crapshoot. The only way to make money angel investing is to build a big portfolio. It's just, I mean, two, three, four, five, six investments and, and expect, you know, you're not, you're probably not going to get a winner. And most of my early investments end up being bought very, very quickly hired or absorbed into mid tier large corp, which happens to a lot of people. This, the founder journey is so tough as, you know, I don't need to tell founders that, that when you get offered whatever, a few million quid after three, four, five, six years of trying to build this thing and getting it off the ground, it's a really, really attractive offer. And nearly all of my, I mean, it's obviously a bunch fell flat on their face, but those that did well were bought by corporate yeah. X after five, six years. Not that I saw much return. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day about 
a lot of money. I've made you know a bit of money here and there. He's lost. I mean, he's 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 lost a shit ton of cash as an angel, and I think he was doing it wrong. He was doing few deals, quite big tickets, but few deals. And we were we were comparing notes. And I said, look, I would have made more money had I just gone in fixed income or just, you know, just done an index tracker or, or stayed in property, I would have made more money. But that's not the point. I think my favorite phrase, which I think is a Daniel Priestley phrase is, um, uh, you die, but founders never do. So it's, it's just about giving it a go. It probably won't work, you know, 9.5 won't work, but give it a go. Because these founders will learn their craft, they'll move on, they'll build business. And it's all about this innovation piece and trying something new. And I'm very interested by money. I'm motivated by change and innovation. So, which is not the right attitude to have as a VC, just to put it out there. But in the early stages, get amongst it, try, do, innovate. That, this, is, this is what it's all about. Well, you stayed very true to the most risky stage of angel investing of being a vc which is the pre-seed seed stage where there is basically nothing to go on other than making a judgment on the person and maybe the idea at the time yeah. but you're also expecting them to pivot at some point because everyone does so let's let's jump into the founding of super seed which is now a behemoth in london a 50 million uh fund 50 million 50 million pound fund investing in ai and automation at the pre-seed and seed stage. How did it start? Did it start as a fund? How did you grow into what you are today? So I met my partner about 2017, Mads, Mads Jensen. He's, um, he's the complete opposite to me. He math, logical, structural, financial head. But we're both different. We both have very similar values, goals, um, the world. So our essence is the same, but there's so much difference. And that's what I think makes a great relationship is that you're the same but different. You bring different pieces to the pie. You're greater than the sum of the parts, I think is the cheesy phrase. And he and I are that in space. We fight like cat and dog sometimes because we just see the world so different in so many ways, but this commonality of values and drive, and we want to make business smarter. We want to create efficiency and productivity in business. I love messing with big business. I mean, that's you know, part of my twisted side is how can I, how can I mess with the corporates? How can, I, how, can I, how can I eat their lunch? Be eaten, by the way. They want to become more efficient and productive. This isn't a one-way street. And we started investing our own money. And then we, we put like five, five million bucks aside to, to be invested in 12 companies just to test the model. Then in, that, was in, that was 20, we got regulated and did that in a fund structure. We call that fund one. It wasn't really. It's like a prototype demo fund. But it was there where we kind of learned the craft because we were both ex-founders with a little bit of angeling, but we'd not built a fund before. Um, and thought, okay, there's something in this. And the, the model is very simple. Invest in founders, so business software founders who are solving difficult problems that are going to make the world more efficient and more productive. And Europe has a massive efficiency and productivity problem. If you look at the States, the numbers have dropped a lot in, if, of the trajectory of, of productivity before 2008 and after 2008. And the States is about 20% off trend and Europe's about 40% off trend. So you've got this massive productivity issue. Europe has a whole world of other issues, but productivity is the driving force here. And if we don't get productivity up, we don't have any of the nice things in society. We have no welfare. We have no healthcare. We have none of the goods very conscious of this. And we want to, at the business level, do our bit to get innovation rolling through and put Europe on the map, ideally. In May, by 19, we're investing. By 20, we'd kind of got our first fund off the track, uh, Super Seed Fund One. And then in 22, we went off and raised, we closed in, I think it was March 22, we raised our 50 million on the same strategy. So very technical founders solving very difficult business problems and, and creating productivity, mainly for large business, but it doesn't have to be, it has to be something that's just gonna, just gonna move the needle. Um, it's not been easy, fundraising is extremely hard, sourcing, selecting, supporting is extremely hard. We're, a star We're still in many ways a startup investing in startups. Um, I feel very passionately about what we're doing. I, we've built a team of 10, half on the investment side, half on the platform side, so we can really support founding teams in commercializing and thinking about customers and going to market. 
And it's, I, I, given my time again, I wouldn't become a VC because VC doesn't serve anybody. It's, it's, it almost serves nobody. But that said, it's a very interesting vehicle. It's massively fascinating to be a part of. And I get to work with some of the smartest people on the planet. And it, that, that is just a gift. I'd love to unpick the platform side. So you've dedicated half your headcount to a tool that your portfolio companies can take advantage of. Yeah. And if we come back, so this is pre-seed and seed stage, what kind of things can founders access that you see your portfolio comp companies loving? It's not that are now platform as in software, platform. it's applied VC, it's applied venture capital, okay. it's platform venture capital. So the two things that we focus on are sales and hiring. The two things that founders fuck up consistently is, is, is hiring the right people and mm -hmm going to market. It's, they're really hard things to do. And when you're a founder spinning 20 plates, getting everything right all of the time is really hard. They're really smart people that we're investing in. They get this stuff very quickly. All we are is a little helping hand when required, a little accelerant when required. And the two main spaces are hiring. So we have two heads of talent and then a team doing that. And then we have all of us really, even the, on the investment side, and then sales, go-to-market, marketing, advertising, and then lots of fractional support, lots of non-exec support. And how do we put our talent pools into your business for periods of time to do certain functional roles and get the needles moving and, and get, the, get the revenues up and to the right and get the right people on the rocket ship? So that's what I mean by platform. It's this applied venture capital model when it's the right time and the right place for the founding team is just to slot in the right function or the right person or the right toolkit so that they can just accelerate their journey onto series A and beyond because it's the riskiest bit. It's the highest returns, but also the highest risk is, is, is seed. That sounds like a really good value add feature. For example, you're going in B2B startups, quite deep tech founders. They might be more scientific yes. than a marketer or a salesperson and maybe might not have hired anyone before. Yeah. And hiring someone for a startup is so critical, that first hire. If you've never hired anyone before, having the chief of talent come in and sit with you or design a hiring plan and actually educate you from zero to hero on how to be a good hirer yeah, and just think would be instrumental. The highest performing people in any arena in the world have support networks. So whether you're, you know, the highest performing tennis player or golfer or business person or whatever you're doing, the smartest, highest performing people have advisors, mentors, coaches, people that, because I mean, Elon Musk isn't building all of these wonderful platforms on his own. If you surface, there are incredibly smart people running those businesses and then he can go off and, and, talk about stupid stuff and spend time on Twitter spouting off nonsense, but everybody has the smartest people have smarter people around them. That's all I'll say. And not that I'm yeah. saying I'm the smarter person. I'm not, but I'm saying we, we connect those dots. But it's also a hell of a strategic advantage for a founder to be able to bring in more impressive support teams and actually share the vision, excite them, get someone willing to step down from a comfy corporate job on a big salary yeah. into a much riskier equity-based compensation package, which probably didn't align with their life goals and savings the day before they met the founder. So yeah, hiring is very important. Is there an example of Superseed tangibly changing a go-to-market strategy for the better with one of your portfolio companies? Yeah. Something that you influenced? I think there's, there, there are a number of examples. So, I think it's worth just sharing two things to start with. There's, there's the marginal gains piece. A lot of startup activity is marginal gains. And it's almost like having lots and lots of little things that end up when you look back on them as one big thing. They're not. There's a 10 o'clock WhatsApp message on a Sunday night, which just changes a mindset. And it's about giving, giving founders access to these support tendrils to do these marginal gains, which then look like, oh my God, you did a tweak or a pivot or you did things, like, nah, that was a lot of conversation and a lot of time. So there's strategic shifts which do happen, but they tend to come or pre-baked with a whole world of other conversations that have gone on along the way. But to give you some outcomes, if we look at, for example, ThingTracks, one of our portfolio companies, they, they help 
manufacturing plants and, and factory floors maintain existing or legacy equipment for longer. They make and software and reporting dashboards and monitoring equipment for the management team. And it was built by two ex-Microsoft engineers and neither wanted to be CEO. They were both incredibly smart technical people, but we hired a CEO, Paul Reader, who became function then became CEO. And he's built the company from like early days, three years ago, 10 grand a month kind of revenues where they're kind of not quite a multi-million pound revenue company and off. And example for you called AI. Do, they build the software for, for robotic arms that do large scale 3D printing for manufacturing. And they work with Formula One teams, aerospace, big, the big structures, 3D printed structures for rapid prototyping and, and manufacturing for large orgs. And they were focused on architectural. That's where they came from. A couple of architects, uh, Michael and Dahan, who go to market testing and, you know, where was automotive and aerospace? So I don't know how you define tweak over, over pivot or calls of conversa- constant conversations with founders, constant marginal gains, constant testing of markets. Go, not changing what you sell necessarily, but it's changing the ICP or the customer profile. So Dick, I think we're all getting a flavor of how Superseed works, how you add value to your portfolio companies. And by being a constant voice in a founder's ear, a friendly, helpful one, yeah. providing best practices, getting them to ask the right questions so that ultimately they navigate themselves to a successful outcome. Also, is... also very, I mean, a lot, I get a lot of questions that I don't know how to answer as a VC. And even with founder operator experience, I don't experience is out of date. I mean, some of the stuff that I know is from five, 10, 20 years ago, and the world has shifted, right? But a lot of VCs are asked questions they don't know how to answer, but they still answer them. Less than 10% in Europe have even worked in a, in a startup. So to any founders listening in or watching, just be really careful who you ask questions of and be the best filter in the world as to what you do with those answers. Generally speaking, if you hear the same thing more than once, in different guises, there's normally something in it, but just really, really filter down because analysts ask investors questions and they've got, oh, well, I think you should be nice. That's really not the way to solve this problem. So just, just be very conscious of who you ask. And just because we hold the money in the purse strings doesn't mean we have the answers. No, I think that's why there are definitely stories of people not being very happy with the board advice that they've been given because these people aren't necessarily in the weeds as much as founders day to day and might not have the knowledge to guide. I had a call yesterday and like, I find it hard to hold the board members was talking about their go-to-market strategy. And this is a company that is, that is you know, burning and running out of cash and, and they're not making the headway that they should be making and that they can make. Like going to market using content. I'm saying content's great, but that's not going to answer the fucking today question. We need jam in the sandwich today. Where's the low hanging fruit to really understand customer one, ICP one, what's the thing now? That is not building relationships on LinkedIn. That is not some kind of you know, thought leadership content strategy. That's after the fact. Please, can we focus on problem one, feature one, thing one? And I, I, I got to get the get the right advice into the right hands at the right time. Not that I always get it right, but there are some things that are objectively wrong, not subjective, but objectively wrong. And that was one of them. It's like, Jesus, man, just get the first sale. The clients will tell you. They might not tell you the truth, but you'll know the truth. You'll see through them. So get the clients on the table. No, that's that's great. That's great advice. Stay laser focused on the things that will move the dial. Try not to get too distracted by things that won't, even if they're more comfortable, because maybe it wouldn't require some self-reflection and some admittance and failure, which you have to have a lot of self-awareness to actually do as a founder and then remove your pride from the reality of the situation. So you're dealing with pre-seed and seed the whole time. Yeah. What kind of things stand out to you as traction? Because it's a non-obvious factor at that stage. It's not necessarily revenue. What kind of things do you like seeing in a deck that make, make an opportunity exciting? It's really hard to answer this question. That the, I see between 10 and 20 pitch decks a day. Um, first thing I'll say to founders is don't spray and pray. Because a lot, I would say half the decks that I see are consumer or not relevant to me. So just don't do that. Don't waste your time. Don't think that downloading some investor database and then 
and then pummeling it with some kind of AI tool that's going to bear you any fruit. So the first are why you want them on your cap table, where you think you fit in their portfolio and why, and why there's, because if it's a thoughtful intro, I will always respond to any thoughtful introduction, cold email, or I mean, I'm not very good on LinkedIn mail because LinkedIn mails are just a horrific thing, but a phone call, no one picks up the phone these days, but if it's a phone call or a message or an email, if it's thoughtful, I will always respond, even if it's off topic. So I think it's really important to keep that circularity. So first thing is get the, find the people that you want on the cap table, work that list backwards. So the ones that you kind of want the least or you're not sure of, you know, make those calls and send those mails first and obviously trying to find the intros. So that's deck. If you cover all of the staples in a really thoughtful way, I don't think it massively matters. Don't just, just know three to four seconds per slide. Just know that we will be looking for the implicit message as well as the explicit. So we eat with our eyes. It can't be a dog's dinner. It's got to be thought through. One core message per slide. How does that narrative flow? But I will pick up a deck and I'll go one, two, three. And I'm looking for the hooks. I'm looking for the, for the magic. I'm, I'm, I, I want to know about you and the market. They're the two main things. Like who the hell are you? Why do you get out of bed? And who are you serving? And, and why do they care? And why, why will they care when you, when you sell to them? So they're the two kind of core lenses. It's like you and market, team and market, team and market. And then I'll be going one, two, three, and I'll punch through the materials. Like, is there something in this where there's a reason for another conversation? Because your only imperative with any email or phone call or pitch deck or teaser deck or whatever it is, is to get the next meeting. You, you don't want to overload it with content or try and be too clever because founders tend to know their business too well and try and want to tell everything on all the slides. Like, I'm amazing. This is amazing. This is an amazing opportunity. You should invest. And they try and, and they word vomit everywhere. You don't need to do that. You need to less is more. Do, le do, do, do less for fewer, actually, I think is probably a massive startup mantra. Just do less for fewer. A uh, from a guy. And I, I kept reading it and I kept reading it and I still didn't know what the thing was. So he'd give me the, I'm amazing, we've got a, this team of amazing and the market is huge. And I was like, I don't know what the fuck you do, dude. I mean, what is the thing? Tell me what the pitch or position the thing. So pitch is, we do X for Y, boom, in your face. And a position is, we do X for Y, boom, in your face. Unlike this lot over there that do that for that. We don't do that, we do this, we do that, we do this. So there's a pitch and a position. Pick your, pick your poison, it's up to you. But, but elegant, simple, why you, why now, yes. however you want to... I, I think that's great advice. I think the main thing founders don't want to hear is take your time over the email and be hyper-customised. I know. There's no excuses now with ChatGPT, with other AI tools. You can put someone's LinkedIn profile in and the bio of a fund and create a perfectly well customized intro that still stands no, out because so many people don't GPT. bother. You can see straight through Claude, Grok, whatever. You can see the gen generic GPT LLM output. But you're right, it should absolutely be a starting point. There is no reason on this planet to, to know your investors. Just create 100, just do this for 100, and I promise you, you'll bear more fruit than, than spray and pray and nonsense. Do the warms. I think it's probably a good time to plug openvc.app, which is our platform. So it's a fantastic platform for any founder looking to raise pre-seed to Series A, uh, 50K to 5 million, looking to get cold outreach to investors. One of the best free tools that there is is an investor thesis match so you upload your pitch deck the computer works out what it is you do and then you get a score out of 100 about how well you fit to each fund profile which helps you as a founder avoid applying to people that are never going to respond to you because they have absolutely no interest in what you do in the space you're in we need more tools like you i can't wait for the day when i'm out of a job because it's been automated away I don't need a human in the loop, but we so need more tools like you. We need the connective tissue. There is no reason why a funding round should take six months or even three months. It is ridiculous. It's, you've got your day job as a founder and then you've got this other job of fundraising. 
and it is, it is such a killer and is such a waste of time and resources. And I want to see so many more tools. I'm not trying to do you out of a job. I want to see so many more tools like Open VC democratizing this connective tissue because it's just nonsense. I agree. And thank you. Thank you for supporting the plug. When it comes to Europe versus America versus the rest of the world and being efficient at work, I've heard you mention in the past that you think there should be a European NASDAQ. Mm. Why do you think having a European NASDAQ would be beneficial? And what would you like to see change in terms of people's personalities in Europe that would actually help society at large? So I'm hearing two kind of two separate camps of, of question or, or two thought strands in that. One is the European attitude and the other is the infrastructure needed to support European venture. Is that okay. is that? Fair. Yep, 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 absolutely. So on the attitude piece, money talks. So the only way to change the European attitude to investing, to technology, and AI has been a massive proponent in this, a massive accelerant in this conversation, which is great because AI is at the dinner table. It's on the breakfast news. It's in your face and people are using it every day. So it's thank goodness for it. For all of its downsides and potential problems, it's a it's created this conversation about investing technology ai so on the on the attitude side on the european attitude side the only way to make change is is through people's wallets the only way to create an attitudinal shift is for the tax regime for the regulators for governments to enable a more fluid investing attitude so SEIS and EIS are great examples of high net worths rather than give the government whatever it is for SEIS 50p in the pound. They can invest that in the, in the next wave of innovation. So you at early stage and there are various versions of this across Europe, not it's not Europe, but there are various versions of this across Europe. There is nothing at growth. So there is nothing beyond a there's a there's a void. And then there is nowhere to list. So companies either have to go to America to list or they end up selling to American corporates. So we need the wallet and purse strings loosened by governments and regulation to create more of transaction in investing in startups, in investing in technology in the next wave and beyond the, the low, early, early stages. It needs to, there needs to be structures at institution level, for pension funds, for ultra high net worths and family offices to, to make it so much more attractive to invest all the way through the ranks. And then we need a European, some form of agreed template or some form of European NASDAQ or some form of listings. I don't care where it is, Berlin, Paris, Amsterdam, London. I mean, there's four times more capital going through London. Actually, it's not less than that than now, but... I know that it's more than double the capital rolling through London than any other European city. So probably London makes the most sense, but it doesn't matter. Let's get somewhere attractive that can get all of the investing capital that's going into fixed income or into property or into other assets or more than likely going over to the States. Keep that here. And the only way to do that attitudinally is to is to get incentives, the right financial incentives to create that vertical stack of investment activity. And that needs some bold decisions at the EU level. And then obviously- the I think you're bang on. Uh, when I first heard the idea of a European NASDAQ, I thought, why on earth don't we have something like that? Why aren't we celebrating our successes in creating an awesome place for founders to exit and list publicly? Because in the news, you, over recent years at least, you've heard listing on London has actually been a disaster, especially for tech firms, when you look at the US comparisons and the multiples that they get there which is why everyone's being acquired by American private equity now. Yeah. And that's a second exit strategy. But it's quite a disincentive for a founder that goes and spends their whole lifetime to then realize that actually the best place to exit is in America or privately being merged, being merged or acquired to a larger entity. So I think you're bang on with that. And the special treatment of startups should definitely happen. I think it's crazy that we're the only European country that has tax offsetting for startup investments. I think Germany have just, They've just started yeah. something similar, but it's not as generous. Yeah. So maybe that's the beginning of something. Well, we need a sovereign wealth fund. I mean, the British Business Bank is doing an amazing job, but they're so hamstrung. 
and they get such bad, necessarily bad press because he, the, the British Business Bank have been given all this money. Like, they're wasting taxpayers' money. They're making money. If we don't get more money into tech and into innovation, we're screwed. It's game over. The UK is already falling behind. And the irony here is that we have all of the talent. The half of the top universities in the world are in Europe. It is absolutely on point with all of the leading innovation in AI and, and front edge technologies. And that all that's happening is that they're being absorbed into American corporates or they're heading over to the States or they're not starting up at all because the infrastructure just isn't there to support them. So the talent is here. The talent is across Europe. Um, vehicles to create, to then invest and then follow that throughput through. And I think the answer is a sovereign wealth fund and much more support from government across the board from, from the building on the SEIS EIS baseline and then really supporting the growth pieces and then really getting into some form of how are we going to how are we going to create european listing or london listing well yeah I, I i hope people are listening and going to make some necessary changes i know we're running out of time and i've just reviewed the questions and one thing i really did want to get your insights on is the bad days of being a vc <laughs> Because founders have so many bad days for every good day. And they're looking up at this godlike entity that can give them capital oh. and give them advice. Hey, don't worry, it's not mine. But I think it's quite interesting to understand what isn't necessarily a great day as a VC. And you touched on one of the th activities that you hate doing that you have to do as a professional, which is sometimes pulling a term sheet. What kind of things might make an investor pull a term sheet when you don't want to. It, the, the energetic connection between founder and investor, because money gets in the way. So founders never tell me the truth because I hold the purse strings and I, I get that. I mean, some do, but most don't. They, they want to give me the glossy version. I, I understand, but don't think for one second I can't see through the bullshit because I do. Uh, my time on that side of the desk than this side of the desk. A number of things that are very difficult in VC fundraising, we have to fundraise like founders have to fundraise. Working out how to build a deal or how to, how to create a deal structure. That is, my, my main viewpoint is I don't care about this funding round, I care about creating the right structure for the next funding round. How do we create success mm -hmm. for the business in the next funding round and beyond? So that's always my contextual lens to putting putting a deal on the table or agreeing a structure around a deal. Pulling term sheets specifically, as I've only done once, I changed it and I changed it and it was the commercial feedback hadn't been as strong. So at pre-terms, I'd said, look, assuming we get this kind of feedback from these clients in this way, then we'll do a deal. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like a it wasn't like a bare face, naked, fuck you, I'm going to pull a term sheet. It was a, it was a thought through process, but it still turns my stomach at it because I, I feel things that I probably shouldn't feel as a VC because VC is a brutal thing. It's speed of sale, speed of scale. And you are either building something that is venture scale and, and, or, or you're not. And I, you know, I, I've got 30 companies that only, only two are going to make it and the other 28 aren't. And that's fine. That's the brutality of it. But in each of those businesses are human beings that I care about deeply. And when you're working really closely with people pre deal and post deal, and it's, it's never ending, it's hard. And so I take those things very personally and I, I get things wrong. I say the wrong thing. Yeah. So I, I understand that there are times so that was new information that was uncovered through market research. Has there ever been a time where you've uncovered maybe fraud or something that just was absolutely I don't have any irrecoverable? Juicy stories. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't have any juicy stories. <laughs> there's, there's been no fraud. There's been, I had one meeting with a guy, it was a very early meeting with a guy and I had to walk out of the meeting because he was so full of shit and what? founders need to have bluff, guff, ego, bravado. I'm going to, I get that. And I love that. And I love the sales pattern. I think that's awesome. But there's a fine line between believing your own bullshit and just being full of shit. 
And it got to the point where I was itching in the meeting and my, I was in there with my partner and another guy from the team. I, was like, I, I, I had to make an excuse and leave because I just couldn't listen to any more of the bullshit anymore. He went on to raise from a very well-known investor, American investor that is globally known, and then got fired from his own business within six months. And I won't name any names, that's not fair, but I think that's the only, that's the only near answer to your question that I can, I can think of right now. I, I cannot be in the same room with you. I have to leave. I love it. So much passion has come through on this pod, on the podcast. Um, I'll leave all the relevant links in the description, your LinkedIn handle, um, how people can apply. Is there anything you'd like to sign off with as a message to founders that are thinking of applying? Heroes. That's it. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Really appreciate your time. Cheers, Harrison.